So, Remembrance Community Church, or, or this is how I plan to start this. Hello, my name is Kenny, and I'm a pastor. I'm not a very good theater kid, obviously, but that was intentionally uh, uh, trying to emulate what it might feel like if we were at an Alcoholics Anonymous uh, a meeting, because that's the way I want our meeting today to feel like. A, a better way of maybe saying that is I want us to embrace the reality that it is okay to not be okay. That's one of the beauties, I think, of the 12-step kind of program and why it is uh, undeniably successful more than probably any uh, discipleship or, or change, uh, behavior change, you know, environment. It just works. Because they create a safe place where it is okay to not be okay. And by the way, it is so good to be gathering, isn't it? Both uh, in person and online. And I want you to know from the bottom of my heart, it's okay to not be okay. Because the reality is, is that everyone gets overwhelmed sometimes. Everyone gets overwhelmed sometimes and has to run to something. You have to cope with it in some way. Not all of the ways that we cope with it, not all of the things that we run to are good things, but we all run to something. We all get overwhelmed. And you may not use the word overwhelmed to describe what you're experiencing. You, you might just be more emotional than normal. If you're like me, you might be way less emotional than normal. You kind of close off or withdraw in those times. You check out. You feel backed into a corner. You start to feel kind of this fight or flight anxiety. Your just heart's racing more often than normal. It's hard to relax. Your, your, your mind is consumed with how you're going to fix the problem. You're extra stressed. You're restless or constantly busy. You just can't stand still. You're easily irritated. You're triggered. You're, you're agitated. You're easily angered. You procrastinate or, or, you, or you distract yourself somehow. You're unable to focus or just do basic tasks. Any good therapist would tell you, you're overwhelmed. You're overwhelmed. And here's what I want us to know, that experiencing these emotions or states of being or whatever you want to call it, these are not indicators of how strong your faith is. These are, in fact, indicators of the fact that you're human. Because we all get overwhelmed and we must run to something. But when you are overwhelmed, what do you run to? Do you run to the Lord? And that, that is an indicator of what you put your trust in. That is a, 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 an indicator of, of your faith. Do you run to the Lord? And when we say that, we say things like that. I, I, I like to call those Christianese. Like that's the thing you say if you're a Christian. Like just run to Jesus, right? Just run to the Lord. But, but what does that even mean? What does that actually look like? H how do we do that? See, these are valid questions that, that I think we should be asking. How do we do that? And this is why I'm excited to introduce you guys to Psalm 142 this morning. Psalm 142, as we're going to see, is a great teacher. Psalm 142 is a great picture of what it looks like for us to run to the Lord in times of being overwhelmed or, or what David is going to call his being in a cave. Being in a cave in the Bible is often a metaphor for, for this experience of, of being overwhelmed. 
But, but before we get too far into it, I would like a chance, because this is just a safe place, I'd like a chance to redeem myself from last week. Last week I started off and I gave you guys a brain teaser. And, and I, was, I was, some people let me know, some people were honest. They said it was way too easy. So I'm gonna try again. Church, here's your brain teaser. What does this mean? If you're online, go ahead and type it in in the comments if you if you know. It's the word feeling. The word in the in the middle is trust God, and then on the other side is is believing. Anyone know? Pretty good one. Thank you. What this is saying, church, is that that there's there's this place of running to the Lord, and it's trusting God in between feelings and beliefs. How do we trust God in between the tension of what we feel and what we know is true? How do you do that? So here's some examples. You might say, I feel like a failure. I feel like a failure, but I know everyone makes mistakes. See, there's tension there between what you feel and what you know, or I feel like no one likes me. But I know there are people who do like me. I feel all alone. But I know that there are people that I can connect with, right? But that doesn't always help. Like, I feel this, and I, I know it's true, but, but just balancing that out, do you feel any better? There's tension there. I feel like no one cares. I feel like no one cares, but I know I'm just hurt by their response or their lack of response. I feel like things will never get better. That's a good COVID one, right? I feel like things will never get better, but I know that they will, but I still feel that. I recently had some experience with this um, at the beginning of my sabbatical, I don't mind telling you, I was overwhelmed. Entering into my three-month sabbatical, I was really overwhelmed. I felt really burnt out. I was, I was feeling insecure about my ability to be a good pastor. I was more hurt than I actually realized, just by random things and deep things and things from a long time ago and things from recent. I was really tired. I would say I felt anxiety about it all. And any good therapist would say I was overwhelmed. And in fact, my therapist helped me to see that that's exactly what was going on. I was just overwhelmed. And I honestly didn't know what that was supposed to look like, but I knew that I was I, was, I needed to run to the Lord, but I didn't know how. I was stuck between the tension of what I was deeply feeling and what I believed to be true. And honestly, it felt like this huge disconnect. And I felt stuck. And I felt weighed down. And wouldn't it be great to have some type of instruction for what to do in this type of situation. So turn with me to Psalm 142. In Psalm 142, at the top, if you have your paper Bible, you'll see it says, Psalm 142, a maskeel of David. Maskeel is a Hebrew word. It's hard to translate. We talked about it a few weeks ago, but Psalm 32 was also a maskeel. Um, there's 14 of these maskeel psalms uh, in, in, in our compilation of 150. So it's like almost 10%. And basically what they are is it's a word that means kind of like instructor or instruction. It's a testimony that's supposed to help you know how to do life, how to deal with something. It's instruction. 
And so this is a, this is a masquil of David. It says, when he was in a cave. Now, like I said, cave is, is often a metaphor in the Bible for being overwhelmed or just feeling, feeling, you know, all the things that we feel that we described. And David was literally probably in a cave. If you know his story, he, uh, in the beginning of his, in the, his, his kingship, uh, he hadn't yet been officially appointed as king. God had anointed him through Samuel as king, but he hadn't taken the throne and there was still a guy on the throne, right? And his name was Saul. And Saul wanted to kill David. He was jealous. He chased him all over the, the nation. And David would often find himself hiding in a cave. In Psalm, I mean, in uh, 1 Samuel 22 and in 1 Samuel 24, are probably the best description. We don't know exactly which cave he's in, but David is in a cave. And he's feeling overwhelmed. And he and, he, and it says a prayer. So he writes a prayer. That's how he deals with it. And it's supposed to be a prayer that instructs us of what we do when we're in a cave, when we're overwhelmed. The cave is a metaphor for being overwhelmed. And everybody gets overwhelmed and has to run somewhere. And David is like, this is what it looked like for me to run to the Lord in the middle of my cave. And David wrote this psalm in a season of feeling isolated and under attack from an enemy who wanted to kill him. And now you may have never had somebody literally trying to kill you, but we all have, have had these experiences. Maybe it's just a spiritual attack or maybe it's just how you feel. The best way you could describe it just feels like, like they're out to get you. Maybe you feel like God's out to get you. Like God's punishing me somehow. This is really relatable to what David is saying. He was overwhelmed and he met God in the tension between what he felt and what he knew was true. And he gets really honest about how he feels, we'll see in Psalm 142. And this is, this is a really important part of what it looks like to run to the Lord for help. Putting your trust in Jesus, it requires us to be honest, even if it's ugly. But remember, it's okay to not be okay. And here are some of the feelings that David shares in Psalm 142. I'm gonna read it just kind of like when I scan through it, this is how I would put it in my own words. Maybe you can relate to it and then we'll dig into what he actually says. And I think you're gonna see this too. He says, I, I feel some guilt. He's in the cave. I feel some guilt. Like maybe this, some of this is my fault. Like maybe I'm being punished. I, I have some legitimate complaints, God. Like I'm bothered and I feel like I have a right to be. I'm in serious trouble. I'm scared. I feel emotionally drained. I'm tired. I feel like people are out to get me. I'm paranoid. I feel like no one has my back. I feel like I don't know where to go for help. I feel like no one cares. I feel like I, I don't have a, what it takes. I'm insecure. I feel like people, people are chasing me to do me harm. I, I feel like a victim here. I feel like I'm stuck in prison. David is brutally honest. Also, David knows who his God is. David knows who his God is. This is also an important part of running to the Lord for help. Putting our trust in Jesus requires us to be honest, brutally honest, but it also requires us to know who God is. Thomas Merton, kind of great writer, and when you're talking about like prayer and drawing near to the Lord, he's, he's, a, he's, a, good, he's a go-to guy, let's just be honest. I don't relate to everything he says, but that's because he's, so much better at this stuff and I'm not. I'm like the other side of the pendulum. I'm just like, suck it up and deal with it, you know? Harden up. I'd be a good uh, uh, football coach. 
or like drill instructor. But Thomas Merton says something great about the Psalms. He says, the Psalms are the songs of men who knew who God was. See, Psalms will give us language we've been talking about and Psalms will give us permission and Psalms are the word of God. Psalms are written in the circumstances that we find ourselves, but by people who really know who God is. So they become a great teacher of what it looks like to draw near to God in these circumstances. And David knows who God is. And so David is a great teacher because he is able to hold these tensions beautifully. He was in touch with his emotions, his feelings, and he was honest about them. And he was knowledgeable about his God. And so all of those feelings were true, but he also says, I know God hears my prayers. He says, I know God is merciful. He says, I know God would rather hear my complaints from me than have me complaining to others. That's deep. Think about that. I know God is empathetic. I know God knows where I've been, knows where I am, and knows where I'm going. I know God can protect me. I know God will provide for me. I know God is bigger than my enemies. I know God can rescue me and set me free. I I know God is going to do things and I'll brag about him someday to others. I know God wants me to be in a good place. See, feeling without believing is unhealthy. Feeling, just feeling, being stuck in your feelings, but not having the truth about who God is, I would say that's unhealthy. But also, believing, knowing the truth, without feeling is unhuman. I err on that side. And David is running to God in the tension between what he honestly feels and what he truly believes. And so let's just read his words together in Psalm 142. And I'm reading from the Christian, a standard Bible. Yours might be a little bit different, but it's close. And he says, in verse one, he says, I cry aloud to the Lord. I cry aloud to the Lord. See, this is David as a man of God choosing to run to the Lord. That's what he's saying. I cry aloud to the Lord. I'm choosing to run to him. I could could run to a lot of other things right now, but I'm going to cry aloud to the Lord. He says, I plead aloud to the Lord for mercy. See, to me, that indicates if he needs mercy, that he's feeling a little guilt or maybe shame. Like it's, maybe this is my fault. You ever feel like that? Maybe this is all my fault. He's pleading with God, like, don't punish me like I deserve. And then he says in verse two, he says, I pour out my complaint before him. In other words, like, I feel like I have some legitimate gripes, God. I have some things to complain about with you. And please listen while I complain for a minute. Did you know God's like cool with that? He says, I reveal my troubles to him. Charles Spurgeon, the late great uh, uh, preacher, about this particular verse, verse 2 of Psalm 142, he says, Note that we do not show our troubles before the Lord that he may see it, but that we may see him. Say that again. Charles Spurgeon says, Note that here, when we say, I reveal my trouble to him, uh, we're not, we're not, we don't, we're not just showing our troubles before the Lord so he can see it right? Because he already sees it. We know that. He knows everything, but that we may see him. So here's an insight to what we mean by running to the Lord, that really it's not, it's not that he doesn't already know, but it's that we are coming out of hiding. We're coming out of our cave and and looking up to God and saying, God, here I am. I'm laying my troubles before you. I'm being honest about it because I need your help. It's about coming out of hiding and coming to him with our troubled souls. 
It's about not running to other things. Crying aloud to the Lord. It's our souls that choose to run to Jesus in prayer. And he's going to find us in the tension between what we feel and what we believe. And here David chooses to have this conversation right in the beginning. He, he, he chooses to have it out loud. He says, I feel the shame and I want to hide, but I'm choosing to run to you instead. He brings his complaints. He shares his troubles. And then he, he continues to be honest. He says, although my spirit is weak within me, you know my way. If you have your paper Bible, I want to encourage you to circle, underline, or highlight where it says, you know my way. And then in your margin, write the word empathy. Because that's what that is. The actual Hebrew word here, that's you, that's, it's in this phraseology, just points us to God's empathy. You know where I've been, God. You know where I am. And you know where I'm going. According to Google definitions, uh, empathy is the ability to understand and share the feelings or experiences of another. Brene Brown is a great kind of, she's best known for her TED Talks and she's just really good about like, like leading with empathy and vulnerability. That's kind of her, that's her jam. And she says, if we share our story with someone who responds with empathy and understanding, shame can't survive. Isn't that good? If we share our story with someone who responds with empathy and understanding, shame can't survive. And so here's David, like, I feel the shame. Have mercy on me. I know you're empathetic, God, and I'm coming to you because I, this, you need to deal with this for me. And I know in your presence, somehow if I just deal with it this way, shame can't sur survive. You're going to rescue me. Then he says, along this path I travel, they've hidden a trap for me. Like, I feel like people are out to get me. And sometimes, like we said, this is a spiritual attack. And sometimes it's an anxiety attack. And sometimes, for, like for David, it's just real. People are out to get him. Saul wants to kill him. Have you ever felt like life isn't just hard, but it feels like someone is intentionally targeting you? Did you know it is, it is common amongst Christians? I know this as a pastor. I've talked to a bunch of you. It's common. It's a common feeling to wonder if God is punishing you or, or getting you back for something. And it's okay to be honest about that because it's okay to not be okay. And he says, look to the right and see what's to your right in biblical language is like the go to is what you, is what you can count on. The, the right is where the strength is. I look to the place where I should be able to look and find strength. He says, I look to the right and see no one stands up for me. There's no refuge for me. No one cares about me. That's how he feels. And then he says, I cry out to you, Lord. I say, you are my shelter, my portion in the land of the living. So if you have your Bibles, you can circle, underline, or highlight where it says portion. That's Old Testament language. And you can write in your, in your uh, uh, margins, right, inheritance. That's what that means. It's your inheritance. My portion is, the, is the, the, the portion allotted to you as your inheritance. In other words, David is like, I know you haven't forgotten me, Lord. I know. I feel like no one cares about me, but I know, but I know you haven't forgotten me. But I still feel like this, but I know there's tension. He just said, I feel forgotten. But now he says, but I know you haven't forgotten me. I know you have for me, Lord. I know you have a plan for me, Lord. I know you'll provide for me, Lord. But I'm really honestly struggling with it right now. And then in verse six, he says, listen to my cry for I'm very weak. 
And Bible students, just go ahead and circle, underline, we'll keep with this theme, circle, underline, or highlight where it says, listen, and, and write in your margins, do something. In the Bible, the word listen means, means a call to response. It's like when you're a parent and you tell your kids, listen to me, uh, what you're really saying, like, I, I, I just said, go clean your room. Listen to what I said, right? What do you mean? Do you mean, please hear it? Or do you mean, go clean your room? Right, it's a call to action. And here David is calling God to action, crying out God. When he says, listen to me, he's like, I need you to do something about this. I need you to respond. And he says, rescue me from those who pursue me for they are too strong for me. Free me from prison so that I can praise your name. So go ahead and circle, underline or highlight where it says, so that I can praise your name and then write in your margins, give me a testimony. Because that's what it means. See, David believes David believes that God will come through and that someday he will have a testimony of God's trustworthiness. And then he ends it, he says, and the righteous will gather around me because you deal generously with me. And note, he says, the righteous will, that's future tense. I don't know I'm experiencing it right now, but I know that the righteous will gather around me because you you deal presently generously with me. Right now, I know you deal generously with me and one day the righteous will gather around me. I don't feel it yet, but I'm choosing to place my hope there. And there's still tension and meet me in the tension, God. That's where I'm running. I'm running to you in the middle of the tension between what I know and what I feel. You know, often we say the, biggest, the greatest distance on the planet is between your head and your heart. What you know and what you feel. And I think what David is saying is that that's okay. It's okay to not be okay. That God is very happy to meet you in the tension, in between the struggle between what you know and what you feel, between your head and your heart. He's not saying, hey, get there first and then I'll meet you somehow. When you finally get it from your head to your heart, then then you'll know what it's like to be in my presence. No, he's like, I'll meet you wherever you are at along the journey if you want to. If you'll just turn to me and cry aloud to me and be honest about how you feel and also cling to what you know. So often, uh, for me personally, and maybe you can relate to this, so often when I feel overwhelmed between the tension of my feelings and belief, I want to bail. Tempted to quit. Like, it's not worth it. I'm just over it. I'm just not going to do it anymore. You ever been there? I'm done. I try to distract myself often and, uh, and numb the pain. I, I just get busy. My name is Kenny. And projects are my drug of choice. I want to run away from the tension. That's what I'm really doing. I want to run away from the tension and not feel uncomfortable. And many times, many times, in the Old Testament and the New Testament, many times the scriptures teach us that it is in the middle of our struggles that God does his best work. In the middle of this tension, between your feelings and your belief, your, 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 your cave, your overwhelmedness. God does the best work. And what David is saying is that the key is to lean into this. The key is to press in. Maybe when we say run to the Lord, we mean just stay right where you're at, but, but let him run to you. 
Maybe we're just saying, don't run to other things. Don't run to your projects, Kenny. Just sit still. My practice, that's the hardest practice, but the most important is just solitude, which is creating a place to just be silent and let God deal with you. So uncomfortable for me. As an extrovert, I want nothing but just to be around people. To get alone with God is the most vulnerable place on the planet for me. I mean, during my sabbatical, I spent a lot of time in solitude. And I have a testimony. God dealt with me generously. And so it's important that we be 100% honest with how we feel. Also, it is important to stand on what we know is true. And by the way, it is really important as a disciple of Jesus, as a follower of Jesus, it is really important to grow in your understanding of God. And this is one of the main reasons why. That way we can be honest, but we can have attention and not be swept away in our overwhelmingness. We can kind of be in the cave and not be thrown off the cliff. If we can learn to ha hold these tensions of how we feel, but what we know. And here's the hope. If you will enter into this tension with God, then you will have a testimony worth sharing. If you will enter into this space with God, this cave, this tension of overwhelmingness and being radically honest and, and, and clingy to the truth. And you'll have a testimony. Like I have a testimony uh, from my sabbatical and many other times in my life that God met me and, and continues to meet me in profound ways. He's freed me from a lot of stuff that I didn't even know was chaining me down oftentimes. And the truth is that I really wanted to run away from it all. But I chose to sit with him in the tension. And it was uncomfortable. And it was slow, which is, if solitude is my number one thing that I hate, slowness is my number. Maybe, maybe, let's, maybe those are out of order. Maybe slowness is my number one thing. I do not like to wait for anything. If you invite me to come over to move, then I'm just going to start moving. If you want to talk, I'm going to say, don't talk to me, I'm moving. This is a little bit about me. And I didn't always understand what God was doing. And I thought, you know, if you know the old, the, the, the original Karate Kid, which was good, you know, like Cobra Kai is cool, I guess. I heard, I never seen it. But the original Karate Kid with Mr. Miyagi, right? He's like uh, uh, doing all these things like paint my fence and wax my car. And Daniel's son, who wants to learn karate from Mr. Miyagi, he's like, what are you doing? A whole season goes by. He's like, what is he even doing? He's just using me. And then at the end, Mr. Miyagi pulls this full on Mr. Miyagi move, right? It's a thing. And he's like, show me paint the fence. And all of a sudden he can block punches. Like God was... Mr. Miyagi was doing something in the middle of all of that where he didn't understand. And God is often doing something in the middle, even if you don't understand. But now I have a testimony to add to the many testimony of God's faithfulness. And Psalm 142 teaches us how to trust God in the tension of how you're feeling and what you know to be true. And that's one practical way that we can run to him for help. So I want to have the worship team come back up and I want to share with you our practice for this week. We've been, we've been in this series called uh, uh, Praying the Psalms and we say the Psalms teach us how to pray and in here we know how to pray a little bit more like if you're feeling overwhelmed, I hope. And this week I want to practice it. So here's what you do. You're going to read Psalm 142 and we've been saying, in the simplest forms, you read it, meditate on it, uh, and pray it. But I think oftentimes we don't know how to meditate on it, so I want to give you maybe just one practical exercise that you can do this week. 
read Psalm 142 and then go ahead and get a piece of paper and draw, uh, split it down the middle and on one side write feel and on one side write no. And just go ahead and be super honest with the Lord. Just say, Lord, I feel, I feel, I feel, I feel, I feel. No wrong answers. You know, go ahead and complain. <laughs> this is the right place to get, get your complaints out, right? Just tell them how you feel. And then, and then next to it, just write, you know what? Here's what I know. And here's the thing. There will probably be some disconnect between what you feel and what you know. And here's the permission. That's okay. That's okay. Because it's okay to not be okay. And in the tension, just wait for God to do the work. Just wait for God to do the work. And so to close this kind of time together and send you guys off into worship praise and then a week of hopefully drawing near to the Lord in this tension, practice. I want to read Psalm 142 in its entirety before you and I want to read it from the Passion Translation. It's a great kind of, I think it's more of a paraphrase is, is to be honest with you, but it's, it's like, it's like a way of taking the, 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 the verses and saying, this is how we would say it probably if it was written today. And so it's helpful. And he says, God, I'm crying out to you. And if you want to just close your eyes and just make this your prayer, I want you to know this is a safe place. You don't have to. He says, God, I'm crying out to you. I lift up my voice boldly to beg you for mercy. I spill out my heart to you and tell you all of my troubles. For when I was desperate, overwhelmed, and about to give up, you were the only one there to help. You gave me a way of escape from the hidden traps of my enemies. And I look to my left and my right, and I see to see if there's anyone who will help. But there's no one who takes notice of me. I have no hope of escape and no one cares whether I live or die. So I cried out to you, Lord, my only hiding place. And you're all I have, my only hope in this life and my last chance for help. And please listen to my heart's cry for I am low and in desperate need of you. Rescue me from all those who persecute me for I am no match for them. And bring me out of this dungeon so I can declare your praise. And all your godly lovers will celebrate all the wonderful things that you've done for me. So church, we've heard the instruction from David, the Maskeel. We've been given some language and some permission. And now the rest is between you and God. And so let's seek to enter into his felt presence right now. And if you're feeling a bunch of tension within that, just enter into that tension with him. If you feel like praising God out loud, praise God out loud. If you need to just sit and be silent before God, or if you need to cry out loud, uh, you know, in anguish, wherever you're at, just run to God because it's a safe place where it's okay to not be okay.